Don't make your living by extortion or put your hope in stealing. And if your wealth increases, don't make it the center of your life. Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so toward you. This is all I have learned. God made us plain and simple, but we have made ourselves very complicated. Yesterday morning was fantastic. There was a big group of folks from Twickenham who went out and helped with the 5K Give It Back track, and that was put on by folks down at the Huntsville Inner City Learning Center, and it was a fantastic day with over 100 runners and close to 100 volunteers that went down there and over four thousand dollars was raised to help with vapor sports and that wonderful ministry and uh, carol may and and her crew and uh, beth mosher did a fantastic job organizing it it was just a wonderful thing to do not only to raise money for this charity but also for the community to have the, all the folks and the excitement uh, running through that neighborhood it was just a, a wonderful time uh, Art Leslie and, and certainly his crew at the Learning Center have been doing a fantastic job. We want to invite Art and Mark Thompson to come up for a different reason because next Saturday they are heading to Nicaragua for a week. Um, they're going to be teaching foundational biblical truths to over 140 lay ministers. And so it's just a tremendous opportunity when you think about people coming from all over Nicaragua and they're going to be teaching them these classes and they're going to be spreading all over the country to see the multiplying effect that that could have. So I'm going to invite Art and Mark to come up, and I've asked Walton Hartless to come and, and lead a word of prayer of these two missionaries as they head out. special men. They're very special servants. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, ever since ever since the time of Abraham, you have you have called your servants to places that uh, that you would have them to go. And that's no different now. And uh, Mark Thompson and Art Leslie have the servant heart and they have made themselves available and they are uh, to be traveling this week and uh, we just pray a, a, an enormous blessing on their work. Father, they, uh, they are responsive. They are obedient to your calling and I, I love them and I thank you for them. Father, in the, in the world today there's a lot of headlines. There's wars and there's there's governments and there's elections and there's all kinds of things that people read about in the news and, and we concern ourselves with. Father, in, in 10, 20 years, 
probably much shorter than that. None of that will make any difference. What these men, what these men do this week will make an eternal difference. They're going to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. They're going to be spokesmen for your word. They're going to talk to people that we will never meet in this life. And yet, they will be bringing your kingdom closer. They will be bringing your word to a, to a dying world. And Father, I just pray that you'll, you'll bless the eternal benefits of this trip. Certainly, Father, bless the logistics and all the travel and the distances and, and, and all of the arrangements. Father, just uh, we, we pray that those, those things that you will take care of and just make those things work very smoothly. But most of all, Father, I just pray your Holy Spirit are in, a, in, in these men in a mighty, mighty way and that you will speak through them. Hearts will be changed forever. And Father, that your, your name will be glorified because that's all that matters. It really doesn't matter what, what we are other than that we are your children. Uh, because it's not about us. It's about you working through us and through your, your servants like Mark and like our. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. I hope that we can all, uh, if, however God has blessed us, look for ways to give back to other people. You know, it's been said that every person has to deal with three questions in life, has to respond to the three questions uh, great ethical issues of human life, and that's what to do with power, what to do with sex, and what to do with money. And those are crucial themes uh, that all of us struggle with with our time on earth. And, and certainly they're not just individual matters, but they're matters that have a lot to do and have great social ramifications. In fact, if, as Walton mentioned, if you turn on the news or pick up a newspaper or look on the internet, uh, a lot of the stories that we read are tied into how people respond to these three things. And certainly as, as God's people, we have to wrestle with uh, what are his teachings when it comes to power, when it comes to sex, when it comes to money. Because Jesus had a lot to say about all three of these. And so I've kind of written these things down. We combat the lure of power with humility and service to others. That's what yesterday was all about. In response to the issue of sex, we look at, and what Scripture talks about is we respond to that with fidelity within the bounds of marriage. And to help to fight against the, the, the attraction and the lure of money, we fight that with simplicity coupled with generosity. And while all these things are important, what I'd like to do is just focus on that last one, talking about simplicity matched with generosity. And the whole idea of the simple life, and I'm going to go ahead and, and lay it out there and give this disqualifier that a lot of times it's easier for us to talk about the simple life and, and to dream about what that might be than it is to actually put those things into practice. So this is something that I'm wrestling with, our family is wrestling with, and I hope that you will begin wrestling with this discipline of simplicity. Living life in such a way that the things that we proclaim are of utmost importance, or as we talked about earlier in the summer, those big rocks, those things that we hold up and say, that's what we value living our way our life in such a way that those big rocks don't get overshadowed by the small pebbles that we don't allow things of lesser importance to dominate the way that we live or have i shared the rich mullins uh line the stuff of earth doesn't compete with the allegiance that we all owe only to our king richard foster in his book the celebration of discipline shares that simplicity is an inward reality that's, mount, that's matched with an outward lifestyle. And what he's saying here is you really can't have one without the other. You, you can't proclaim that God is the most important thing in my life, that I love him and, and everything is, is foundational, is, is built upon this love I have for God, and then it not come out in how we live in our lifestyle. He says, conversely, you can't put together this, this discipline of simplicity and start doing all these things unless it's motivated by what's happening within your heart. He said otherwise, if you start putting these things into practice, and not just this discipline, but others. If, if, if it's for any other reason than our response to what God's done for us, well, then you're ripe for legalism that's fueled by pride. But first, we need to recognize and, and, and realize that in our culture, it, need, it values neither this inward transformation or does it value this outward lifestyle of living simple? 
In fact, it's the exact opposite. We live in a culture that values keeping up with the Kardashians and living the sweet life of Zach and Cody. Well, how do you do that? Where you spice up your kitchen, you trim out your truck, you say yes to the dress, and you know what not to wear, and you decide whether you're going to love it or list it all if the price is right. I mean, that's what we see on television, isn't it? That's what's out there. And so that is the story that's being told to our families. And so as we tune in, we're like, wow. And and so we find ourselves craving the things and running after the things that the world says is important. And a lot of times, the reason and the motivation behind some of our our purchases is so we'll be liked by others and we'll, we'll be accepted. Arthur Gish, in his book, Beyond the Rat Race, says, and you've heard this before, but it's great, we buy things we do not want to impress people we do not like. Have you been there? Yeah, yeah. Why do we care what they think about us? We, we're so driven, and we, have to, we feel like we have to keep up, that we'll lose our social standing and be knocked down a notch. And so we feel compelled to have the latest thing, especially when it comes to electronics. And, and part of it's not our fault, because when it comes to technology, sometimes it's driven by plan obsolescence. You know, the people that are in this business make what we have obsolete. I'd be perfectly happy to keep going with my 8-track tape player if I could get new 8-track tapes. But, you know, that's several generations. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Ask your grandfather. Okay? But so it's, it's this plan obsolescence. And so if we're going to compete in this world, we have to keep up. A lot of times we blame that on our purchases when in reality... It's a psychological obsolescence. We can't bear to be seen or our kids to be seen out of the latest fashions. You know, they have clothes and things that haven't worn out, but we feel like we have to keep up. And so what we do is we open our wallets and we open our purses because we don't want to be driving a high-mileage vehicle, even though it's still got a, a, lot, of, a lot of road to, to go. Boy, we don't want to be seen in that. So we open our, our wallets and our purses And we make that purchase. And sometimes when we swipe that card, it validates us as a person. I'm with it. I'm relevant. I'm current. And, you know, suddenly that crowd that we're trying so desperately to keep up with is now defining our life more and more if we're going to run with them. And, of course, there's this whole idea that if you want to buy more, you have to make more. And so... A few years ago, our, our children were playing the game of life with their cousins. I don't know if you played this in a while. But if you aren't familiar with it, you, you get your car first. And one of the first stops that you make, you spin the dial and you land on one of about seven spaces that determines your occupation and your pay level for the rest of your life in this game. And so I remember hearing one of the cousins say, wow, I'm just done. I'm done with this game. There's no way I can survive in this world on a teacher's salary. And my wife is in that room. Amen. You know? <laughs> and sometimes we, we continue this cycle of consuming over and over. And, and a lot of times it's because we want to keep up. But sometimes there's a deeper issue. We keep going on this cycle of consuming because we don't want to deal with the bigger picture. We know if we stop this cash hemorrhaging that buried within us some things will come up and some questions we really don't want to deal with it's easier just to spend and and to get that rush from that than it is to really wrestle with what's going on with ourselves and with God so we we just choose to keep the machine rolling where does that end in his book Fight Club Chuck Paladuk describes the emptiness of this cycle He says, you buy furniture, you tell yourself, this is the last sofa I will ever need in my life. Buy the sofa, then for a couple years you're satisfied, though no matter what goes wrong, at least you've got the sofa issue handled. Then the right set of dishes, then the perfect bed, then the drapes, the rug, then you're trapped in your lovely nest, and the things you used to own, they now own you. You been there? Have you felt that trappedness in your life? The things you, you thought would bring joy suddenly have, have, have confined not only how you live, but the, the amount of, of, of time you spend working and, and generating funds to pay for this lifestyle that you put all around you. 
But Jesus is calling us to something different. Jesus provides us an, op- an opportunity to live in a way that honors him. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, where Jesus tells a story, a story that in their um, agricultural-based economy, they would resonate with tremendously. And he tells a story about a farmer that's blessed with a tremendous crop. And how many, have you noticed that in our movies, what generally happens in the storylines of television, we love the story of the poor guy that gets rich. Very rarely where they tell the story of a rich person that decides by choice, I'm going to become more humble. And so the, the story starts out with this farmer that has become rich. All of his crops have come in, and it has surprised him. Now, the, the only problem is his barns aren't large enough for this huge harvest that, that has come in. What an opportunity. And some would even say, what a blessing from God. But Jesus talks about how are you going to handle this situation? What does the farmer do? Well, he uses the surplus grain as collateral, and then he decides to make an investment in infrastructure by increasing his storage capacity in order to expand operations. The, father knew by, the farmer knew by adding these material blessings, they're going to allow him to expand operations, and they're going to allow him to retire early. Isn't that great? And the text tells us to take life easy, to eat to drink, and to be merry. It's the American dream. Isn't that what they hold out for everyone? If you'll stay in school, if you'll go ahead and get your college degree, then you'll get the right job. You'll get the right paycheck. You live in the right neighborhoods, and your life is going to be blessed. And if you work hard and you set back a portion of this, then, boy, you can retire early, and then you can really start living. That's what's sold to us. And that's what the American dream is, that everyone is trying so desperately to hold on to. Luke 12 and verse 20, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Who will get what you prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself that is not rich towards God. You know, for years I, I read that passage thinking what he's getting at here is if God blesses you and and you've been given all this stuff, you better not be stingy when the collection plate comes by. You better be getting in your tithe. If only it were that easy. I I really think what Jesus is talking about is more than just returning a tithe. He's talking about where your heart is. Because if you couple this with Matthew 6 and verse 20, Jesus is talking about storing up treasures in heaven like this farmer He says, if you're doing that and have all these blessings you're looking for, how can I maximize my wealth so that my life can be this one? He said, that's where your heart tends to gravitate towards. He says, don't do it. Don't fall into this trap. Instead, allow your heart to be captivated by the treasures in heaven and the work of the kingdom of God. Here's what I love about Jesus. Um, I, I've always heard you're not supposed to come to a meeting and raise a problem unless you've got a solution. Well, Jesus comes with a solution. He says, you want to know how to live your life? He said, just look around as we leave today. Watch kind of out what's happening in nature. He said, the ravens, I mean, they're kind of these dark birds. No one really cares about them. Do they store up? Do they pick up this grain and, and make little cubby holes where they store it up? No, they go each and every day, and it seems to work out fine for them. God takes care of them. He says, you guys worry so much about food and you're worried about clothing. He said, do the lilies sit there and, and, and try to spin clothing for themselves? No. But yet Solomon, who had all these magnificent robes, can't be compared with the lilies. He said, that's what it's like to say, God, I'm totally dependent upon you. Lord, it, the, the kingdom is out there. The kingdom is where it's at. The kingdom is where my focus is. Everything else is just tent building. I'm just trying to get a little bit so I can expand the kingdom, do whatever I can for your glory. He says, when you're running after these things in the world, there, really there's no difference between you and, and those that don't know me. And there should be a difference. So we got goes on in verse 33. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, treasures in heaven that will not be exhausted. No thief comes in, no moth destroys. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
He said, you, you've got to guard the heart. A lot of times we, we want to get down into specifics about how I'm supposed to do this, how much I'm supposed to write and everything. What's going on in your heart? He said, there's a real danger here. What, is, is Jesus calling us to completely uh, divest ourselves for the cause of the poor? Maybe. I don't know. But certainly there are things that each of us could sell and that could help the poor. And it's not necessarily about the poor because Jesus says, well, the poor, they're always going to be with us. I don't think he's addressing the cause of the poor. I think he's caused, he, he is addressing the heart of the rich. That's what he's concerned about in this passage. He says, you've got to get rid of this, not based on what they're going to do with the money. or, or, or what. It's what happens when you give it away and you sell these possessions to simplify your lives because God wants to grab a bigger part of our hearts. Amen? What do we talk about here? Well, sim simplicity is a calling. Simplicity is a calling first to acknowledge that everything that we have is a gift from God and it's a grace, gracious provision that comes from God. And, and it's something that we need to realize on a daily basis. That's why I love in the Old Testament when they're traveling out in the wilderness that they gave manna each and every day. And, and the people that tried to gobble up more, well, it's spoiled. He wants us to come each and every day and say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Everything we have comes from you. Number two, simplicity is a calling to see that our provisions are something to be enjoyed but at the same time, we need to realize these are resources for the kingdom. You know, when Jill and I were, were first married, and we wrestled with, well, how much should we give to the church? And, you know, should, should that be pre-tax or post-tax? And, you know, all this stuff, or after-tax? And, and, and so we're wrestling with all these things in our mind. And someone really helped us and said, well, instead of viewing how much should I carve out of my salary for God, instead of we view everything as kingdom resources then you start asking a different question uh lord uh, how much of these kingdom resources do i need to get by because the rest i want to be used for things that are eternal as walton talked about in his prayer things that will truly make a difference and so then we begin to look at life differently and say i i, I think i can cut back i think i can live more simply also simplicity is a calling to share our blessings with others they're not resources to be amassed. You know, don't know if you heard about the elderly couple in the, uh, the south side of Chicago this week that they found buried under their stuff. They lived in a three-floor apartment and didn't get out. They're in their, their 70s. But they went in and found out that they had stuff floor to ceiling, and it had gotten so bad, their amassing of possessions, it eventually crumbled over and knocked them over. And they, the people were, were kind of incoherent when they went to go pull them out they were suffering from dehydration and malnutrition and also rats had been chewing on them and it was just a horrible situation but they figured out they'd been there about two to three weeks because this stuff that they had accumulated ended up collapsing on top of them but you know uh, we, we look at that as an extreme and go well that's not me but i, I want to tell you we don't have to be a couple of knickknacks away from being on the show hoarders to have our hearts out of line when it comes to money and possessions. We, we don't. We can look in, in, at our lives and say, well, our house is pretty clean, but then realize we haven't completely given it over to God. You know, we, if, if we believe what we have is stuff that we've earned, and if it's something that we've earned, it's something for us to protect, and if it's something for us to protect, well, then it, it's not for others to have. It's not available. And so if, if we live with that mindset, here's what we have to do. We have to hide it away. We have to protect it. And so if we're in protection mode, then we get into the mode of fear and anxiety that's driving it. Because it's something that we have, it's something that we protect, it's something for us. And so everyone else becomes someone that could take our stuff. And God says, that's not the way to live your life. We've got to learn to trust him. We've got to release from the simple life this fear and anxiety. Well, to, to sum up this inner attitude of the simple life, Number one is everything that we have is a gift from God. James 1 and verse 17. We're simply stewards of what God's given us in these kingdom funds. Matthew 25 and verse 14. And what we have is available to others. Luke 18 and verse 22. Okay, well, what about the outward expressions? Let's put our faith into action. Let's kind of, where's the rubber hit the road? First thing I want to encourage you to do is buy things for their usefulness rather than their status. 
okay, this is hard. It is. But it's a huge temptation that, that drives our purchases that we, we want to impress others. And so we overspend, and it, it's tempting to buy more house than you need. You know, I was flipping through the channels the other night, and I, I landed, I, I noticed a, a guy, and I'm like, who is that? He looks very familiar. His name is, is Danny Bonaduce, or Bonaduce. You want to know who he is? He, he used to be on, on what show? Partridge Family. Okay, so he's kind of this goofy guy, and now he, he's a talk show host. And he was living in Philadelphia, but his, he, he's now his show has expanded, so it's syndicated. He's, he's got to have a place in New York. And so he's meeting with this real estate agent, and she said, what are your criteria for this apartment that we're going to go and find? He said, I'm not going to tell you about square footage. I'm not going to tell you about neighborhoods or any of that. But this is what I'm going to tell you. I want a place that screams wow. I want you to come into my house and say, he's doing great. This place is stunning. We may not admit that and be so forthright because we're not in the world, but don't we struggle with those things? And, and, and what we drive and where we live and, and what we dress, we want people to think you've made it. And you, you struggle when you go back for family reunions, not dropping where you've gone on vacation and everything, because you want people to think of you as a success instead of looking at you what Jesus says. You want people to look past you and look at Jesus and see what Jesus is doing in your life, to see how he's captured your heart, to see what the kingdom is doing through what you've been up to. That's what we should pursue. Number two, reject buying that puts things before God. For me, the main area we struggle is in the area of clothes. We, we want to be noticed. We want to be liked. We want to be accepted. And for many, clothes are a convenient way to make those things happen. If you look at our closets, they're bursting at the seams, and yet we feel compelled to keep going out and getting more. Simplicity is about freedom. It's not about slavery. Refuse to be a slave to anything that comes between you and God. Number three, develop a habit of giving things away. I used to love to go to my, my grandmother's, especially towards the end of her life, because I'd walk through her house. Oh, that's pretty. Take it. Okay, yeah. Kind of like that. It's yours, you know. And she goes, and she started getting post-it notes. Write your name on it. I'll put it up underneath it. So when I'm gone, you can say, well, Grandma said I could have it. She put it in her name. And, and that means nothing to her. She knows I've got a limited amount of time. I love you. Take what you need. I'm not going to need it. I'm going on to something better. Why can't we develop that attitude right now? Just to say this world means nothing. Let's get on with our kingdom work. So we've got to develop a habit of doing this. Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist says, you've got to repent because Jesus is coming. And you've got to have things in your life that show that you've repented. So the folks are like, what does that mean? He goes, I'll, I'll tell you. Some of you guys have got two coats. You walk past people without coats. Take one of those that you have in your closet and go get someone else. It's very convicting. Jill went down to Texas for a couple weeks uh, to get the kids in camp and all that. And so I went through all of our closets. And I found I had eight coats in my closet. And I used about two of them. Why? Well, one was one my dad had, and he passed away. I kind of not, you know, one was a gift from my brother. It's this duster. And why do we hold on to these things? I, I don't think Jesus, in, in, in this context, was thinking about what it means to us and how much we have. You know, the world is telling us to accumulate. I want to turn that around for each of us and tell us to deaccumulate. You know, this was a discipline our family tried to do together. And we went through our closets, our shelves, um, out in the garage, and just in the attic went through stuff. It didn't take us long, and we amassed 16 bags of clothing, household goods, and furniture. And it, it wasn't stuff that didn't have value. They all had value. It's just stuff we weren't using. That was just wrong. Gone. If you walk in our house, you're not going to notice that anything was gone. That's how much stuff that we have. I want us to, to try that. I want you to start this afternoon. I'm, I'm serious. I want each of the families here that are here today to do this. And I'm going to give it to Wednesday to go through this. A lot of your kids aren't back in school. Get them to help you out. Go through your closets. Go through anywhere you store. Get rid of stuff, even if it has value. Ladies, just give it up. You're not going to get back to that size. Just get rid of it, okay? <laughs> Put all that in bags, and here's what I want you to do. 
bring it up here Wednesday night. I'm going to have the yellow truck out there, and I want that truck full. I'm serious. And some churches pass the collection plate if there's not enough. We're going to leave that truck out, and I'm going to keep sending emails till that truck is full. We've got the stuff, and we've got people that need it. We'll make sure it goes to the right place and gets to the right charities. I want it full. And if you've got furniture that, well, I know I need it. I'll come pick it up. I will. And I'll drag Steve or Lincoln along with me to come get it. So call us. I want it gone by Wednesday. I want this to be the first fruit of your simple life to clear out. And I'm serious. Wednesday night, bring your stuff. Drop it off. We'll have it out there in the afternoon on Wednesday afternoon. Drop it off after work. If you don't come on Wednesday night, you sinner. Okay? So please come on up. Simplify your life. In Jen Hatmaker's book, Seven, An Experimental Mutiny Against Excess, the author, the author decided to go a little further in the discipline of simplicity. And this is what she said. If I'm serious about addressing overindulgence and irresponsible spending, I need not look any further than my closet. I spend more just on clothes in one year than the average Ethiopian family earns in almost five. Sadly, I only wear a tiny percentage of these clothes. What she do about it? For months, she picked out seven items of clothing, not including undergarments. And she said, that's all I'm going to wear. That's when I'm going to do it. And you know me, I don't just kind of read about this. We got Ada Hanley has agreed to do this. Ada, Ada, come on up and share about your month of wearing seven articles of clothing. So we're going to start over here, and I want you to tell us what you chose. This is a big deal for you to only be able to, to narrow it down to seven articles of clothing. So let's see what you chose for your month. Kind of hold up each article and kind of show us. Do I have to? Okay. Yes. This blue dress. Um, I went with a lot of dresses so that I didn't have to do as much laundry. Um, I work out, so we agreed that I could have one workout outfit. Okay. And a tank top and capris, and then two more dresses, and one pair of shoes. They're old. They're like eight years old. Okay. So you wore this for an entire month? Yes. Okay, for those of you who don't know, I've actually been trying to do the disciplines it, the week leading up to it, and so I don't know if anyone in the office knows, but for five days in a row, I wore the same outfit. No one said anything. In fact, my wife didn't. I had to tell her I was doing it on Wednesday. She goes, really? For three days, you're wearing the same thing? Yes. Okay? It's tough, y'all. It is. All right. So te- now we know what you did for an entire month, and I want you to just share a little bit about your experience, because I know you journaled about it and everything else. Just kind of share what was going on physically and also spiritually with the discipline. Okay. Um, it was really easy for me. I'm not a huge clothes person. Okay. Um, the one thing, I work out every morning with some women here at church, and one day my stuff didn't get dry. And I came in just angry because I was in wet clothes. And um, that afternoon I was thankful that I had a washing machine and that I had a dryer and that we had running water. Just because we are so blessed. I had seven articles of clothing to wear. There are women all over this world who don't even have a dress. And um, by day 10, I wrote, I love the freedom I feel with seven items. There is not much of a decision what to wear. There is not an option to let the laundry pile up. I literally throw something on and go. And throughout the month, I got to where I didn't care about what I looked like. Threw my hair up in a ponytail, lived life with my kids, and it was wonderful. It was freeing to just wear clothes. It didn't matter what it looked like. I mean, I didn't go grungy anywhere. Right. But just to step back and go, this really doesn't matter. Yeah. Hey, how did people respond? Because you, you ended up sharing with the girls that you exercised why that you were dressing the same way every day. They, you know, nobody really cared. I noticed that nobody cared that I wore the same thing all the time. I went to a wedding at night in these flip-flops and this long dress. Um, I was very self-conscious. I didn't notice one person look at my shoes all night long. Yeah. So something that becomes all-consuming for us really wasn't all that big a deal. Yes. Um, Now, Jen Hatmaker says in her book, life is not about adorning myself for attention. It's about simplifying for God's glory. Did, did you experience that? I did. Um, and, you know, in our flesh, we seek out our own glory. We want people to notice when we lose weight. We right. want people to notice that we have a new dress and it fits us very nicely. Um, and 
I notice that we tend to seek our self-worth from the people around us instead of the God who created us, who loves us. And your passage you read about the lilies of the field, I mean, he clothes them every day. Um, And a neat thing that I've learned just through life is, you know, when you have young children, they don't wear out their clothes. And I'll get to the point, we have a ton of hand-me-downs, and I'll think, okay, I need to start looking for clothes for Chloe for this season. Somebody brings me a bag of clothes in that exact size. And I'm like, okay, Lord, you know, thank you for providing. Yes, we could go out and buy them, but I see that we don't have to. Um, And in Colossians 3.12, he says, Since God chose you to be his holy people, he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And throughout the month, I just kind of dwelled there and going, okay, Lord, you provide the clothes that go on my body. They don't really matter. How can I clothe myself in the things that you call priceless? Right. Um, and is there something else you want to ask? Stephen? Well, I'm just going to ask. You, you mentioned that it wasn't as big a deal for you, but especially here at church with your kids. Explain just a little bit about, about your daughters and that. Um, I remember in our early years wanting to make sure I had enough dresses to go through a season so that my kids wouldn't have to wear the same thing week after week. Well, my girls love like two dresses a piece, and they always want to wear the same things. But I didn't want my kids to get made fun of because, oh, you wore that dress last week. And just that selfishness in my heart from that standpoint and um, just... I guess being so thankful for what we have yeah. has become a neat thing. And realizing, um, I read the book Kisses for Katie as I was doing this fast and over the last month. And just, we are so blessed. Yep. We are so rich and we don't even see it. And we want to hold on to it. Um, and you also uh, mentioned that when you gave up this fast, when it was over, um, it was on like a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning one, and you suddenly were faced with uh, a bigger decision than what to wear on there. And just share how that went. It took me 45 minutes to pick out what I was going to wear. That's right. It, it is a discipline that you would help. I mean, not just the, but just this whole idea of trying to live more simply. Did it help you in your draw closer to God? Yes. Um, Psalms 32, 8 and 9 says, The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Don't be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a brit and bridle to keep it under control. Um, I think the beauty of all these disciplines, mine is very minor. Mine isn't spiritual. It's close. I mean, seriously, it's close. Um, But the discipline of fast opened my heart and mind to seek God's will for me. Right. And the prayer, just asking God to wreck me for his glory, became what was on my heart. Um, and that's when my passion for this Both Hands project came about. Right. And for adoption and for the widows and the orphans in the world. Um, and it's also when God confirmed to me that it was time to go back to nursing school. Right. Um, we want to do medical missions as our kids get older. Mm-hmm. But it's for his glory and not my own. Right. So with any discipline, it's not simply about the discipline. It's about raising awareness and allowing God to have space in your heart. So. Thank you so much for sharing. Let's show Ada our appreciation. <laughs> Susanna Wesley was truly an incredible wom- woman. She was married to the Reverend Samuel Wesley. Susanna gave birth to 19 children in 20 years, and not all of them lived, but still is an incredible feat. And she uh, birthed two extraordinary sons, Charles Wesley and John Wesley. And while her husband was busy with church work, it was left mainly to Susanna to, to help raise uh, her children, educate her children. Um, and when Samuel was away in London for six months, uh, Susanna didn't really feel like that the associate minister that was filling in for her husband's pulpit was giving enough uh, spiritual uh, food to her children. And so at night, on Sunday nights, they would gather together in the kitchen and she would preach to them the sermon that she would have given at the time. And some other neighbor kids started coming, and then their parents came, and suddenly they had over 200 that were crammed into the Wesley's house 
Uh, in fact, it was outpacing those that were coming on Sunday morning, and the associate minister wrote to Charles and said, you got to stop your wife, and said, well, she's on a mission from the Lord. But in, in spite of, of just her tremendous blessing and everything she was doing, she recognized and had to come to grips with the divided love between her Lord and earthly things. And she talked about how it came to head at midnight on February 9, 1709, when a massive fire broke out in their house. And she was most concerned that all of her children were able to get out. All had made out except John, but they had to go and, and rescue him before the house collapsed around him. And what was interesting is Susanna is, is, is counting all the heads, and she gets them all together out in the middle of the street. And there's nothing that can be saved from this fire. Everything they have in this world has been burned to the ground and has perished. And this is what she had to say. She gathered her children together and she prayed to God, Help me, O Lord, to make a true use of all disappointments and calamities in this life in such wise that they may unite my heart more closely with thee, cause this to separate my affections from worldly things and to inspire my soul with more vigor in pursuit of true happiness in thee. May we all share in this same sentiment that the stuff of earth can be pushed aside so that we can get back to the heart of worship so that everything in our life can proclaim it's all about you, Jesus. Our praise team is going to lead us in one verse of this song so we can concentrate on these ideas. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to something that's a word that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within though the way things appear you're looking into my coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i've made it when it's all about you all about you jesus i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. This morning we'd like to offer an invitation and in just a moment we stand and sing i'm going to ask our shepherds to go out into the lobby here and to make themselves available and in the twickenham room and this morning if you're thinking about this and you're thinking there's some stuff in my life i need to get rid of there's some things i need to do to simplify my life and there's some things that have been putting distance between myself and god i, I pray that you'll open your heart I, I pray that you'll allow this corner of your life to be explored and that you'll allow God's forgiving grace to come in and the healing power of God can make things right in your heart. And certainly our, our shepherds are available if you'd like to, to pray with them about that. And as we contemplate these things, I, I pray that we can strip away everything that is keeping us, you know, the, the things that just don't matter, so we can pursue the things ultimately that do matter. Certainly the waters of baptism are available. If you've gotten to the point where you're like, I'm ready to give my life over to our Heavenly Father, or if there's an area of your life you'd like to confess to this congregation, or you'd like to come for the public prayers, this church, all those things are available. God wants your heart. God wants you to have everything in this life, and he wants you to be so consumed with his kingdom that that becomes the big rock, that becomes the thing, that becomes a pearl of great value that you'll forego everything else in order to have. Lord wants you to come to his son Jesus. I'm going to ask that you consider coming forward, consider 
telling everyone, this is what I want most. If you'd like to go and offer prayers, they're there. We ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing. I'm coming.